Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this day and for the opportunity that we have to meet together to try to increase our understanding about um, a key issue that's affecting our society at this time. We pray that our minds may be um, open to the messages that we're going to receive, that we'll be able to um, understand the perspectives and the viewpoints expressed and be able to reconcile them with our own and um, take those parts that thou wouldst have us understand. We pray that thy spirit may be here. And we love thee and pray for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You're very kind, and I'm honored to be here and honored that you would uh, come to listen. Uh, I'm here uh, by permission from the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Biology and the College of Life Sciences. That's not to imply any uh, sponsorship. Uh, I alone am responsible for what you'll hear tonight, and uh, I'm not representing views of BYU or my college or department. I think that there are three questions which thoughtful people will inevitably ask about the subject of homosexuality. <coughs> They're related to one another, and in fact, they uh, sit together in a nested set, set. And at the center is the issue of cause. Even if we were to be able to know everything there is to know about the origin of sexual orientation, it would still be intellectually important and spiritually important for us to ask whether orientation is changeable. Uh, exploring these two complex issues would naturally lead us to try to understand uh, what it
it's like to be a gay or lesbian Latter-day Saint. Tonight, the topic is the first of these, the cause of homosexuality. So let's rephrase the question in these terms. Perhaps most often, this issue is uh, reflected in the question, uh, do gay and lesbian people choose their orientation? I'm going to begin with a very brief introduction to the topic of human sexual development. Women have two X chromosomes. And those two X chromosomes create a default biological system. Humans with two X chromosomes develop ovaries and a female brain. And that female brain is most often uh, adapted to be attracted erotically and romantically to males. Boys are different than girls. <laughs> Men have a Y chromosome. And the Y chromosome changes the default program of human development. There is a gene on the Y chromosome that has been identified and cloned and its function very well described. And one of its primary consequences is the presence in relatively large qu uh, quantities of the steroid hormone testosterone. Sexual orientation is about the programming of the human brain. Testosterone is responsible for that in a complex way. Sometimes testosterone itself will activate receptors and begin biochemical signaling in the brain. Sometimes it is converted to a related testosterone-like compound, which can do some of that brain programming. And then non-intuitively, testosterone in the male brain can be converted by this enzyme. I'd like you to remember its name for a few minutes, aromatase, into the female steroid hormone estrogen. Estrogen programs a male brain to be male. Now, this program is complex, and it's not the same in every species. The degree to which each of those has an impact in programming uh, the brain and the reproductive biology of a person uh, is different in humans than it is in other mammals. These then are the actors. This ring system that you see is the biochemical basis for steroids. And it begins with the production of the molecule cholesterol. Fancy biochemical footwork can convert cholesterol into these other examples of steroid hormones. We're going to begin looking at the evidence for how sexual orientation is programmed by looking at sexually dimorphic traits. I'd like to make it clear at this point that the empirical studies that I'm going to report to you, uh, that I have not been a direct participant in any, of, in any of those studies. I come to you as a student of the subject. I have tried to keep abreast of uh, 